and hello good people of the internet it is I Tommy Kelly this is Adventures in Woo Woo and welcome to the monthly question and answers or ask me anything session that we do here on the channel or on the podcast if you're on the audio only if you want to get in on this for next month simply join the Patreon and uh, ask your question and if there isn't enough questions on Patreon then you could join the Discord and we get questions from there too but Patreon's questions get answered first and all that with time allowance we delve into the discord world um, we're in the office today usually we're out and about somewhere quite nice and picturesque in uh, the scenery of the northeast of ireland but uh yeah the storm hasn't gone away it's a bit cold and uh i got new lights <laughs> so i got new lights for uh the tasta podcast so i wanted to test them out um so I'm doing it in the office. Hopefully it's still somewhat um, interesting to look at. Although I can't imagine the standard YouTube bookshelf <laughs> and a bit of an altar with a blue light is really going to excite too many people. Anyway, let's get into these questions. Jackie. Hi, Tommy. Hi, Jackie. My question is, do you think all works of art and inspiration come from a divine place? Let's compare, for example, a silly cartoon drawing to a Salvador Dali painting. Do you think whatever sparked each comes from a divine place or is it only with particular works of art? Something I've been thinking about lately and love to hear your thoughts on. Thanks. Right, well, my first kind of thing in that, and this is definitely coming from me, is that there's definitely, um, there's a judgment in there that I'm not particularly, I don't really like in a sense that it's like, oh, this kind of cartoon drawing in a Salvador Dali, as if, you know, you, you, you're relegating the cartoon drawing immediately as not being in the same kind of realm as a masterpiece of work and I understand why of course but then you look at say something like a Calvin and Hobbes cartoon thing that is wonderful it's exquisitely drawn it evokes amazing kind of feelings within you uh, possibly nostalgia because you might have read it as a child but even uh, um, not reading it now there's something that you can definitely still probably a form of nostalgia but something that definitely resonates within you or whatever and it can evoke feelings in you that in no way and on no day that Salvador Dali could ever do. And it could speak to something, in a sense, a bit more true or a bit more kind of widespread or more common or something that's more inher inherent in us all than, you know, self-construction with boiled beans, which is, you know, it, you can kind of, when you look at something like that or the, the you know, the, the, the Christ one, or any amount of Salvador Dali ones, that there's kind of, it's pointing to something completely different. It's as if, say, something like Calvin Hobbes is pointing to you, <laughs> and Salvador Dali is pointing to, to something else. So very, two different, very different things, um, and two very different worthwhile things that um, I would find it hard to, uh, and I understand what people do, and it, it kind of irks me, but I know that's within in, in me. Um, but to answer your kind of question more, like, say, so you're, you're, I suppose we could do it in something it's just it's like a throwaway drawing compared to a masterpiece drawing or any work of art. My kind of gut would say, well, if it's not where, you know, where is it coming from if it's not coming from a divine place? But in order to kind of agree with that, you would have to, to subscribe to what I think art is, where it's you're taking something from there. And I don't really mean that in a directionality point of sense. You're taking something from consciousness, idea space, from potentiality, from chaos, and you're bringing it here. Again, there, it feels there's some other directionality in that, but I, 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 why I'm kind of hesitant with that is I don't want to kind of make it sound like it's over there to be discovered. It's here, but it's also not here. I don't know, I can't really discover it, but, or I can't really explain it properly, but uh, there's something lost in trying to think it's, a, it, it's in a distant land and it's something you know you have to go on a trek to find. It's here, it's coming to you, it's actually at you. My kind of experience is it comes to you rather than you have to go and find it. So whatever sparked it, I certainly know that at times that when I have felt the uh, kind of dissension of idea space or an idea that it's, it's time has come, who's found me, um, and wants to come out, there's definitely compulsion to it, there's definitely a feeling that you know you have to, in a sense, drop everything else. And there's also a feeling that it's a remembrance, it's not an invention, it's not something that you have to create. It's, re it's almost like you're trying to remember. It's the great kind of way with this, I can find is that it works that if you're thinking of a song, say you're writing a song, 
And oftentimes for me, it kind of feels like I'm trying to remember what the song is or I'm trying to uncover what the song is rather than create the song. So you play something, say, play D and you sing the melody to G and go, no, that's not it. That's not what the song is. And it's like you're trying to uncover it rather than, you know, make it. Uh, and so that, 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 that sensation is very kind of, I can, that's very real and it's very tangible and it's very recognizable. And other times, say when someone asks me to do some sort of uh, work for hire or a portrait or something that is just, you know, doesn't feel in a sense inspired, as in, you know, it, the spirit is within you or whatever, it can just feel like work. It can just feel like you're doing something. But it's still, and I suppose it's coming from a divine place, just maybe not my divine place, if you know what I mean. So I would suggest, ultimately, in the bigger thing, all things are coming from a divine place. Even the simplest line drawing quick doodle while you're on the phone to someone to the greatest masterpieces of the world from Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, Salvador Dali, Caravaggio, you pick your master. Um, two, it's, I, and I guess certainly would pull, put uh, Bill Watterson, uh, Calvin Hobbes, um, or a load of kind of um, cartoon stuff that is considered childish or um, unimportant or a retrogression or something you, sh you shouldn't have uh, put on the same kind of pedestal as some sort of serious, proper, allowable artwork. And I have time for both. And uh, I think it all s sparks from it. But there is, in my experience, a recognizable difference from when you're inspired in the sense of inspiration, when an idea has arrived and says, I'm having you, get me out, or get, you know, manifest me, then something that, uh, you maybe just have to do it because of work or you, you know, that, you know, you just have to get this done or something like it, like it, because I'm trying to think that like in that when I'm doing the comic, not every panel feels inspired. It sometimes it just feels like, oh, I just have to get this done. But the overall thing does. I'm probably not answering your question brilliant, uh, brilliantly well there, Jackie, but I, that's kind of where it is. I think ultimately all things are uh, divinely inspired, whatever divine means to you. Um, but sometimes more, uh, more divinely inspired than others. We'll do with the animal farm uh, answer to that. Abraxas, as someone who's invested quite a bit, of, uh, quite a fair amount of time on bettering yourself, do you find yourself second guessing your feelings a lot? Is this personal asshole or am I projecting? Is my heart valid or is it just my ego making me feel the victim, etc.? And how do you deal with that? Um, there's kind of an extra layer with me on that as well because. Um, I, uh, as I've discovered, I ha I'm a highly sensitive person. A highly sensitive person, for those who don't know, it's about 20% of the population, if the science is to be believed, seems to be legit, but uh, there's definitely detractors and people that don't agree with it, but uh, they, there's a certain sect of people, and they don't have to be introverted or extroverted, it's not based on that, but that are more sensitive to their surroundings, to people, to emotions, to what's going on around them in the sense of, as an example, if you're in a group of people, I would be acutely aware of who's feeling uncomfortable in that and try and you know, bring them in or make them feel more comfortable, almost like a compulsion that um, I'm feeling that. And it's, it, people get kind of mixed up with the empathic stuff as well and that, that's a bit new agey and stuff like that, but it's something like that, but it's not, it's not a psychic thing. It's just that you're, you're aware of what it is because you, or know what the situations that trigger people or you, you're sensitive to the situation. Um, and so what happens, I suppose, with that is that you can, and doing any mental work will get you this as well, doing a, a self, self-help work or self-shadow work or whatever's the correct word, work on yourself, betterment of yourself, I like that. Um, bettering yourself, that's what you said. Um, you will start noticing things in people that they're not necessarily noticing themselves. And I don't mean this from a kind of a, I'm better than you kind of thing, but when I, like, you'll start not agreeing to go along with the social norms in that kind of thing. Is, is there something wrong? No, I'm fine. Um, whereas you're, uh, you're meant to kind of agree with that and be okay with that and kind of move on as if you're not. But with me, I find I know you're not. So I also know you're lying, but sometimes I'm not sure if you know you're lying. Um, so there's an element of that, that that can be quite confusing where I'm trying to work out, am I meant to not know that you're in bad form, even though I know it's clear to me that you are? 
or in good form or whatever it is. It's usually bad form because it's people don't tend to hide their good form. Um, and with regard to the other stuff, I, this is going to sound egotistical, but I'm so seldomly wrong now when it comes to um, our people assholes or that gut feeling thing or whatever, that I'm, even though I am wrong at times and I'm caught out with it, it's more, it's more wise thing for me to do to rely on that than it is to just discount it all together because it's more right than it is wrong. And when I am wrong, I'm, I, I'm easy, I have the ability to admit that. Um, there's another thing I want to talk about projection that came up to, with me in therapy. Now, I don't know if this is an actual thing, but what my therapist talked about, and it made sense to me at the time with, with regard to projection. We have, or I had, gone into therapy, this idea that projection was just, you had had a shitty experience, say, with your parents, or a, a crap relationship, romantic relationship, or whatever it is. And then when you're in the next romantic relationship, you are scared of that same thing happening. So you keep seeing evidence of that where there isn't evidence of it. You know, like say you had someone who two times you uh, in a previous uh, relationship. Now you're hyper aware of two times. So every little minute kind of thing that your current partner does, you kind of jump in it, projecting your previous experience on it. Um, there is another type of projection that we do as well, is in that you take your stuff, and in that, sorry, in that first projection, the other person isn't actually doing it. You're just literally putting all of your stuff onto them. They are in no way two-timing or flirting or doing the things that you think they're doing. That's one form of projection. Now, my therapist was telling me that this, because I was, he was saying, oh, I think you're just projecting. I go, no, this is actually happening. And he goes, oh no, that you, you've, you've kind of, don't understand what projection means in the sense is that when you have a certain type of experience or life or you're a certain type of person or whatever and say even traumas happen to you or something like that as you go through life in a sense you teach people how to treat you so if you're used to having an overbearing kind of relationship uh, where your parents or your, your friend or whatever it was a sibling was particularly overbearing to you that kind of feels familiar, that energy is familiar, that's something, although you hate it, you don't like it, you don't enjoy it, it feels home, it feels that's kind of your vibration you're at. And so then you go out into the world finding new relationships and kind of zoning in on the type of relationships that are a bit like that, the, the kind of, that dynamic. But you also then tell people how to treat you, you know, by interactions, by, um, you know, your general day-to-day -day or, or how you deal with arguments, how you let people away with things, how you don't let people away with things, how you let people walk over you, how you get angry with them, all of these things, you teach people how to treat you. So in a sense, if you're in a relationship previously, come back to our first example, where someone two-timed you all the time, um, and then you get a kind of a sense of insecurity and all of that, you can project that into your subsequent relationships where you are in a sense creating that because you're teaching people, you're teaching people how to uh, treat you or how to deal with you. And so, uh, i just lower this wheel. And so, well, in that kind of sense, the projection, you can kind of go, it is happening. The actual thing is happening. The person is doing it, but uh, you are projecting it. You're in a sense creating it. So there's two different types of pro pro projection in that kind of sense. And I, that's the only place I kind of came across it. And I under, I, I'm sure it's a thing, because it seems so right because I can see it playing out in my life that I have taught people how to treat me. And the worst thing about that is that there's, there's kind of no coming back from that kind of relationship because if you kind of change your relationship, your dynamic towards people who you've taught how to treat you, and that, that, that you just become a, like the asshole, you know, because you're going, well, why are you changing? Why are you, why are you changing the whole dynamic of the world? Why are you trying to be different? Why are you arguing? Because it just constantly becomes an argument. Um, I, mean, I, I know that's not, not uh, exactly what you were asking, but it's kind of the answer that um, I feel I want to give in that um, just be aware that of the two different types of things you go, am I projecting? Is this something that is actually present or is this something that I am creating? Um, and trust yourself in this thing because the, the feedback you're getting from the world isn't necessarily the truth. I found that to be unbelievably true in that uh, 
so many times. I'm sure you've experienced this too, that you'd have said something, people go, no, well, you're completely out of line or you're wrong or you've done something that's not right. And then come back months, weeks later and go, you know what, that thing you said to me that time, I was completely right and I just couldn't accept it at the time. But of course, you have to do the same. You know, you have to be willing to, to, to listen um, to your own assholenessness. Assholenessnessnessnessness? So yeah, that's a good question. It's one you're all, you, you know, you always have to um, kind of worry about and think about. But do enough work and you'll start seeing things in yourself too. No, it's not just all external. You'll start seeing things and you'll start seeing how things aren't matching up. And it becomes a bit more obvious when you're being an asshole and when you're projecting and when other people are being assholes. Crow Crow. Are you doing any magical experiments, projects that you can talk about? I am, and it's kind of—it's another one of those things with me that doesn't look kind of, I suppose, ostensibly like a, an actual magical work. I'm going to do something which involves it around, um, like I was doing that the, the song I did last week on YouTube where I'm just singing a song with acoustic guitar. I'm going to do a bit more of that. Whether I actually put it up on YouTube or not is, is kind of incidental to the thing, but it's all around um, some, the thing that came out of the Tasta podcast, I was ta- or the thing I talked about in the Tasta podcast yesterday, were about realizing that my when I'm singing that um, I'm inhibiting myself because of lack of confidence but also because of hearing the voices of people who've criticized me and put me down and told me I'm not good enough or you know don't get ahead of yourself don't think you're anything special all of those things that it's an actual an inhibition and a lack of being able to communicate effectively or express myself effectively um, and so I want to work through that, and that seems the best thing to do that is in a, in a performative sense, in a ritualistic sense. And of course, uh, singing a song, doing a gig, that kind of thing, is a ritual. It's a magic ritual. I always felt that. Um, so, yeah, so there's something about getting that out. I need to get something out. And which would have been impossible to do kind of years ago because there would have been the um, more of an emphasis on doing music or wanting to be a rock star, say, in order to be validated by someone else, to be told, to, to get that thing that you, that I'm, to get that validation or to get that um, thing. When I sing and the, the inhibition, to be told that that's okay and to be allowing myself to sing, that it's kind of that externalizing the truth and, and allowing, being told that you're okay. So it's that validation in a very normal sense, but also just kind of given your expression or your truth is only allowable if other people allow it. So it's again working at these things. I've talked about this before. If you're if you're new, I bang on this about a lot on the, the Tasta podcast and various different vlogs. But it's a, a, around trying to recover giving away my truth and authority of truth uh, externally. And this seems to be the latest kind of uh, emanation of that, where it, it it's involving expressing. Uh, in a true way rather than in inhibiting inhibiting myself uh, and w- w- without having the need or the want to be successful with it on a kind of material level you know not to become a great singer not to become a world famous rock star not to write brilliant songs or that it's it's literally to get to be able to my to have a clear channel to express myself that's that's and it's 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 the trajectory of that is um it's quite long on where that, that's coming from. So, um, yeah, thanks for asking. Jason, is there a deity, a spirit, or other entity that you're interested in working with, working with but haven't yet for some reason? There really isn't. I'm not hugely that interested in working with spirits or deities or any of those things. Um, and I think it probably comes a bit from... One, there's probably an element of me is not really completely sold on the idea of spirits or deities or... You know, other than the them being a, like a thought form, you know, a kind of a, a deliberate contraction by me uh, in order to work with a particular energy. Um, but it, with the person personality or the personification of that, then brings in a, a kind of an element that I'm not totally gone on because it, because the contraction then involves rules in a sense. So like, if you're contracting that kind of obstacle removal or in a sense, I suppose, the uh, clearing the road, the road opening thing of Ganesha, um, it, it, it comes with a personality of Ganesha. That's quite obvious. He's the, of all of them, it's the one that I, I, I'm, is most obvious to me and most complete in my head of what he feels like. Like, I mean, I absolutely know, for me, I mean, other Ganeshas are available. 
uh, or Gnesh, as most people call them, um, which just feels wrong to me. That sounds like chocolate, you know, that chocolate thing you make. Uh, but yes, yeah, so it's the most complete, but it's still, it's within a contraction, right? Because that's what a deity is in a sense, um, a contraction of the of ultimate potentiality contracted into a a particular stream in order to work with it, which is what the 40 servants are, of course, as well. But there's, and there is a personality within that kind of thing as well, or a kind of a, a rule set. Like the healer can only be the healer, so it's a contraction into healing or whatever. But, uh, so, within that, I suppose, that there's, it's, it's like, I, 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 there's not, I don't know, it's like, what's the, what's the confusion now? It's that I don't feel the need to do that. I don't feel the need to contract in any kind of way. A lot of this comes down to, I think, of why I don't do an awful lot of kind of low magic. Is that, is, is that I kind of have everything I want. And that's not to say that I'm, I'm rich or have all the material things or whatever. I don't really want anything. Um, even the things I want, I don't really want them. So there's uh, no... There's no drive towards interacting with something to get something. I'm not sure I want anything more. You know what I mean? If anything, I just want to stop feeling sad all the time. That, that, that's kind of it. And I think until I get over that, I don't really, I, I can't really focus on anything else. And that kind of thing that I was talking about in the question from Crow Crow about this kind of trying to express myself properly without inhibition is part of all that. Which I know that's kind of throat chakra stuff and sadness is, for me anyway, is more heart thing, but it, you know, it depends on what, what way you're walking through these things. Um, so, I mean, so I suppose, is there any spirit or daily or other? No, because I, I've made 40 of them that are, you know, <laughs> that if I do need something that I can go to there um, and they definitely feel mine you know definitely feel they're on my side that there's something I can work with that I don't have to in some way appease or go asking or, or um, follow a set of rules that you know are a, a ritual or something like that I don't know um, I, the only time it's kind of like when we do stuff for the tasks of rituals you know for a bit of fun or a bit of let's see what happens or whatever but there's no kind of yearning for me towards that because I suppose anyone who I did want to do I did kind of bother most of them just didn't care it's like Harish says about uh, spirits so it's just like humans some of them are interested in you some of them are uh, want to cause you harm the vast majority of them don't give a shit about you and so you know I've, that, <laughs> the ones I've kind of tried to bother for the most part don't really care um, so yeah none happy enough with the 40 I have and the select few that pop up every now and again. I did really want to get into the Norse stuff because there's something there's a real kind of attraction to that but I didn't um, I just couldn't gel with it or something there was just something that the uh, they didn't sit same with like what Morrigan and stuff a lot of it just didn't feel like it went anywhere so I kind of gave up on it too and made my own versions of that energy or that contraction which worked better. Max, better magical hygiene, staying well informed, even if it means getting upset about the state of the world or narrowing one's focus to the knowledge that puts us in good spirits. Well, that's a timely question, given the situation in Europe at the minute. Um, I definitely have a better mental health space when I stopped reading newspapers. Who reads newspapers anyway, anymore? Um, and uh, watching the news uh, and what I do kind of know is just I do enough that I'm informed but I don't do any doom scrolling I don't look into anything um, in depth I don't sit in front of a TV like and watch the same kind of footage news footage over and over again like you know when like say like 9-11 happened and they showed the same footage for like 17 years or whatever it was after constantly on a roll I think when you're kind of getting into that what you're, you're kind of trying to feed the addiction or the, the trying to get the high of the doom again you know where you're just sitting there waiting for the next disaster to happen and um, there's a kind of a, a part of that as well that waiting for the next disaster to happen is to so that you're you don't have to do anything so you can give up right and um, that it's got so bad that it's oh it's all gone to hell I don't have to do anything I don't have to worry about it I can't do anything about it and um, you know, so it's kind of a way of surrendering to it, it's, you know, by trying to get it to become as bad as it possibly can. Um, 
that said, you know, I mean, like, you're powerless. To, like, say that the thing in, in Europe at the minute with the Ukraine, with Ukraine and Russia, and all that goes with that, whatever. There's nothing I can do about it. There's literally nothing I can do about it other than be sad about it, stressed about it, angry about it, um, worried about it, in fear about it. And none of that's helping anyone. It's certainly not helping me. It's not helping anyone in Ukraine. It's different for people, say, like uh, Spud, who's uh, very close to it, or Bira, or, you know, the people in Ukraine or whatever, um, that you have to, you know, in a sense, be more aware of what's going on. But what good is it doing me to be aware of it? Then, of course, that, that, that goes, well, what if everyone thought like that? What good is it any, you know, if we go, oh, well, sure, that's just over there. It doesn't concern me. And I, you can, we can clearly see that that doesn't work either because, you know, that all leads to all sorts of terribleness as well where you're just ignoring, and, you know, almost even spiritual bypassing and stuff like that as well where you're just kind of, well, that's not happening to me. It's happening to them over there. Um, nothing I can do about it anyway. So I don't know. You see, that. So you, you, no matter where you go in the kind of, direction of these things don't look at it leads doesn't lead to a great place look at it doesn't lead to a great place feeling you're empowered you're empowered around it that you can change something which you clearly can't doesn't lead to a good place feeling you're totally no power towards it so why even bother doesn't lead to a good place and ultimately for me it comes down to the, the wonderful thing <laughs> that i was told um, is that this is just the nature of the place in which we find ourselves it's like, water is wet, this is the world, and um, do your best within it, knowing you're not going to solve it, knowing that whatever route you take still leads to somewhere that's not ideal. Um, at least for now, at least for now. Uh, so a little bit of each. I mean, did some guy maybe in India <laughs> a couple of thousand years ago talk about the middle way? Uh, and I think that it's the only way to do it. Inform yourself enough that you know what's going on, but not enough that you're doom scrolling. Um, try to help as much as you can without thinking you're more powerful than you are, but do the bit that you can do. You know, if you can't fix the situation in, uh, in the UK, I keep saying the Ukraine, because when we first <laughs> heard about Ukraine here in Ireland, it was through like a Euro 88 uh, football championship, and the people on telly called it the Ukraine. So that's my natural thing. So Ukraine, so, what was my thought there? Yeah, so if you can't do anything about the bigger situations, fix the things that you can fix around you. And in a sense, not in a sense, in a very real sense, that is fixing the world, fixing the universe. You know, clean your room, attend to your garden, um, fix a relationship with your dad, um, have a better relationship with your kids. You know, that wonderful, wonderful saying that uh, I think is rammed ass. Um, I've been told it's Ramdas, but it might be Ramdas. Is tend to the part of the garden uh, that you can reach. Do the thing you can do, and that's all we can do. Um, plus, there's negatives for exposing yourself to the doom of the world. Um, I have haven't found out other than not engaging with it to the level I used to has definitely been better for my mental health. Is that a good thing? And if everyone did that, probably not. Uh, Chadwick. I'm interested in hearing what you have to say about habit and practice. From meditating to keeping a journal, I've always found it difficult to incorporate, incorporate steady, habitual practices into my daily life. I like novelty and disruption. Disruption. Doing the same thing daily, no matter how much I know it's good for me, makes the most wholesome tasks onerous. Except, of course, for vices, but that's why they're vices. Did you have any difficulty getting going with any of the practices that you currently employ? Artistic, spiritual, health, or whatever. If so, how did you manage to get them to stick? Um, I hated meditation forever. Um, I've on and off my entire life I've tried to meditate and it was no good. Could, could never get a consistent practice. I started really trying hard, I suppose around 2014, I think 2000, maybe. I got into Zazen, reading a lot of Brad Warren or stuff at the time and really went for it. And I really disliked it and it would put me in bad form and it would be something that I, I would put off, you know, uh, to later in the day that I really you know, even thinking about it would put me in bad form and I really disliked it. Um, but I kind of found other things as well. A lot of reading the Baptist Head stuff was a real big change for me around meditation and how that kind of opened up into a different kind of a thing. The Daniel Ingram book as well. 
Um, and so for me, with regards to meditation, one of the big things that kind of changed was the, the directionality of it, where you, 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 they're always kind of, you're told, not always, certain p- parts of meditation, you're told that it's, you know, to give to put in this huge effort. It's all about concentration, not losing your train of thought. As soon as you do it, bring it back, counting those breaths, trying to, you know, name or tag, you know, 30 things per second that so come into your awareness and all that. And I found that very, uh, what well, well, hard, but also uh, annoying. <laughs> and uh, while I do find that it probably has a huge benefit, it clearly has a huge benefit, there's a point where it becomes, for me, um, at least at this, uh, this stage, um, too, I have too much uh, the opposite of what I want, where it, which was expansion um, and widening and a, a greater understanding. It seems to be, and it lessens my creativity in that, of course, when you're putting uh, intense concentration on something, it is a contraction. So um, and creativity is the opposite of a c- contraction for me anyway. Um, I can understand why people would describe it as a contraction, but for me, it, creativity is the other way. It's an expansion. It's coming, where concentration say, is going this way in, creativity is this way going out. If that makes any sense, but that's how it feels. And so a letting go of effort uh, in my meditation practice changed everything. Um, in that I started wanting to do it, looking forward to doing it, enjoying it. Um, and I don't mean that in an indulgent type of way, and that it isn't hard, or sometimes you know you don't have a bad day or whatever. But the general flow of it, the general overall idea, feeling of it, uh, where it became an effortless thing, rather than trying to achieve something, where it was just letting what was be. That that was a game changer for meditation. Um, for the other things, for the art stuff and for the music stuff and for any of that. Um, no, there, it, it, there was, uh, if anything, I wanted more hours in the day to do it. There was never a kind of a, a case of feeling I had to do it, you know, I all better sit down today and practice guitar. It was just something I wanted to do, you know, and it's like a great thing Steve Vai talks about. Um, Steve Vai, if you don't know him, he's, he's like this virtuoso guitar player from the 80s. He's still going, he's great, he's still recording albums in New Alma two weeks ago. Um, and he talks about that if you want to be this kind of virtuoso guitar player, then you're going to have to like spend 10 hours a day practicing or whatever. And, uh, you know, and he says, that if you, when you hear that and you go, oh, I, I just couldn't do that, I wouldn't be into that, he goes, then it's not for you. You know, because the people who are doing that aren't forcing themselves to do it. They're kind of, that's what they want to do. That's where they define themselves doing. And he was saying like at the weekends where you try to get in, you know, a 30 hour practice or whatever, he felt at the end of it that there wasn't enough time, that he wanted to do more, that he wasn't forcing himself to do it. You know, it's this kind of idea of if it's, it's not, I'll come back to that, that the thing that, you know, you'll gravitate towards, it's the thing that you find yourself doing what, you know, you know like, what are you procrastinating while doing? What are you, that's kind of the thing, the thing of least resistance. But that's all to, that can get you into kind of, while well, I just sit here and, you know, drink coffee, watch Netflix, not do anything with my life. But it, it, it's just... So, I, yeah, because I know people who do that. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's like a, the, the line of least resistance, the thing that you want to do, or the thing that I suppose in a sense you could say that you're called to do or is trying to come through you, doesn't take any effort in the sense of that you're not forcing yourself to do it. Sitting down practicing for 10 hours on a guitar um, can be an awful lot of effort and can be good straining, whatever, but you're enjoying it. You're not struggling. You're not, well, you could be struggling to do it, but you're not forcing yourself to do it. It's not something that you're demanding of yourself. It's not something that um, you're doing to become a better person. It's just what you're doing and you're loving it and you're enjoying it. Same as people with sports or um, any of these kind of things. But I mean, I don't know how that then works with regard to vocation-wise, with regard to sitting and watching Netflix, you know, and you could quite easily then bring in a judgment going, oh, someone is sitting playing guitar for 10 hours a day, someone is sitting watching Netflix for 10 hours. Obviously one has been more productive than the other. Maybe, I don't know. One person could be studying to be, you know, to make films or whatever. And you could see like, uh, how that happened with regard to playing computer games where people are playing computer games and uh, so many people turn that into be, being able to have a job out of it or make money out of it. But I think the kind of a notion that your passion has to be something that makes you money, uh, it's just such a weird notion that we have in current such c- civilization and that I don't think it's a good thing. I mean, it's like your passion is only valid if, it's, if you can make money from it, if it's of value to, you know, the, the market. 
And um, yeah, I mean, like, like you have to eat, you have to live, all of these things. So I just, I don't know. So I would say, well, regarding what you're talking about with vices as well, that uh, um, the good things can be vices too. Uh, you know, like it's like your diet can become a vice in that you can't break it. It becomes a taboo to break it. Your, you know, your extra exercise, skipping a day of meditation if you've been doing it for 20 years, you know, kind of in a sense gamified it or something can be impossible to do and probably something you should do because it's in a sense it's become a vice. You're just doing it out of a habit, out of, you know, afraid of missing a day, not getting the full value. So taking a week off could probably be a good idea. Um, so yeah, I think your question is more about not is doing, so let's say my artistic stuff, my, um, now my meditation stuff, the music stuff, all of that would be in a sense to me a vice because that's easy to do. It's something I'm, I gravitate towards doing that if um, I didn't have to do it, I'd be doing it. That's uh, the, the time to answer that. But then the, the, with regard to doing, trying to do stuff that you don't want to do, like a diet, say, that you, you really, you know, give up, I don't know, cigarettes, whatever it is, um, you just kind of have to bull through it. But same thing, there's a good thing with the, the kind of idea of giving up cigarettes. Until you're ready to give them up, you're never giving them up. And I know that because I smoked for years and it was like, give up for you, you know, many, 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 many times. And then when it came to it in the end, I was just done. You know, and I was, until that point, I was never going to be done. All the other times were never going to be successful because it was a completely different feeling at the time. I was like, no, that's it. I'm, you know, that's, it's just, it's a done, it's a done thing. Um, yeah, so maybe with regard to, as I was saying, with the meditation stuff, if you find it hard, just f try different types of meditation until you find the one that suits you. Um, ultimately, maybe just don't meditate. Go for walks, you know, do something else, but... Uh, I don't know. Meditation's great once you get through it, though. Great and great for you. Um, and I like, ultimately, I like rich or um, habit. I like. Um, I like. I, I like the same thing. The, 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 my brain won't give me the word. Um, you know, the same thing happening every day. I like um, routine. Thanks, Tommy's brain. I I, I like that. I, I, I'm able to get more things done. And one of the reasons how I, <laughs> I tend to get more things done is because I feel bad when I don't. And I can blame Catholic guilt for that in that there's a kind of a sense of um, I need to be productive, which is something I have to work on because I don't need to be productive or at least not to the level that I feel I need to be in order to be validated. By what? By who? By what? You know, so um, it can work in all things that you can, you know, feel that you're you need to be productive maybe you don't maybe that's something you could sit with so that's it that was uh nearly 40 minutes well wow. and uh, so good people of the internet uh, we do this every month we also do one card 47s readings we do some uh music around here as well we do a weekly podcast uh tommy and spud talk about and um usually a vlog as well once a week so you got to the end, well done. Well done you for listening to me for 40 minutes. That's uh, well done for sticking to it. Maybe I'm your vice. Uh, so yeah, good people of the internet. Hopefully by the time we talk again that the situation in the world may have in some way balanced or rectified itself. And uh, we can go for some period of time in the future where there's not some <laughs> worldwide looming apocalypse wouldn't it be nice but i suspect that's just the nature of the place in which we find ourselves there will always be a looming apocalypse but there will always be a looming awakening and a golden age such as the nature of the world so good people of the internet be well